This is Brad. Y'all, y'all met me a couple of times. That's Wade Falcon. Hey, and how's everybody doing? He's going to talk to us a little bit tonight and uh, about Joe and, and Cleoma Falcon. Now, so, so, wait, who, who, who were Joe and Cleoma Falcon? I mean, what were they known for? I mean, and why would you do this kind of research? Oh, that's a good thing. Uh, good question to ask, uh, Brad. To, to be honest, I hope everybody can hear me out there. I uh, hope everybody can see me. Um, so, Joe and my <clears throat> Joe Falcon and my uh, my uh, grandfather were first cousins, and uh, they grew up in in uh, Crowley together. Um, Joe Falcon and uh, Cleoma Bro are the first Cajun musicians to ever record. So. Um, Basically, uh, they're the first people to ever getting some really bad reverb. Okay, from me. Uh, really I bad. Okay. So. Well, maybe we should check on the audio. Uh, do I sound pretty bad? <laughs> Looks like we're not sounding so great. Um, ju just keep going. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll see if I can adjust it a little bit on my end, and maybe. Don't move around too much while you're talking. Okay. <laughs> that might be what it is. I might be just doing that a little too much. So uh, I hope everybody can still hear me. I hope the reverb is going away. I hear just a little bit, but uh, it's not so bad that you can't keep going. It's it's all good right now. Okay, good. So uh, back to the back to your question. Joe Falco and Cleoma Bro were the very first uh, Cajun recording artists ever and they uh they were the first to come around and record cajun music for a major label and they kicked off the entire genre of music if you've ever listened to cajun music um and, and enjoy cajun music a lot of the standards that were um played for in, in years to come were all created by joe and clem many many of those standards and they uh, they opened the doors for a lot of other musicians to come and play and re get their music recorded for the first time as well. Um, and so there's a lot of history there. There's a lot of history in the family, and there's a lot of history throughout their entire recording career. It spanned from about 1928 to roughly about 1937. And uh, throughout that time frame, they recorded something about like 40 different songs. So, um, so anyway, my, my, my research has been uh, tracking down their recording career. Uh, finding out what life was like for them, both in their family as well as during their uh, musical career, uh, where they places they played, uh, other recordings that they issued out, uh, who was singing on what, and uh, just trying to track it all down, really. So. so it sounds like they would have had a pretty significant impact on the on the culture, the music that as it evolved, as it originated, came up. Uh, I mean, can you tell me a little bit about how, you know, who they impacted, who, who, who they influenced? Uh, sure. They influenced everybody in the 1950s for sure. You know, uh, people through, between the 30s and the 40s were trying to get the same traction that they were getting in the recording uh, studios. They were trying to get the same exposure that Joe and Cleoma had. And so people like Dennis McGee and Amadeo Ardoin were following in their footsteps. Leo Swallow, uh, J.B. Fuselet, a lot of these musicians that created some of the earliest standards um, – that are still played today, you know, uh, it would be in the 1950s, late 40s and 50s, that people would start taking their music and um, modernizing it and uh, converting it into very well-known songs uh, throughout that time frame. Uh, but uh, it all started in 1928 with the very first recording uh, for Columbia Records. So, How did they find themselves getting into that situation? I mean, I mean, obviously the music goes way back. We had people, you know, that were that they took their instruments with them from Nova Scotia, I'm guessing. But the uh, what led to them doing a, getting their first recordings and whatnot? Um, that's a good question. So what happened was is that they were um, they were financed by a jeweler in Rain, Rain, Louisiana. Actually, uh, there was a very uh, wealthy guy named George Burr, 
And what George did was uh, he was interested in selling more Victrolas, the, the big machines that recorded the records. And he sold them in a store, but he knew that if he actually had Cajun music on records, he would sell more of them. And he was based in Rain, and I was talking to Tony Olinger about him not too long ago. I'm trying to track down some of his history as well. Um, but he financed them to go to New Orleans. And when they get to New Orleans, um, they end up uh, uh, recording the very first Cajun song ever, which was Alonzo Lafayette. Uh, it's a very well-known song. Uh, I know the song, but I know it more from the uh, – somebody did it kind of recently. Uh, I did a remake of it, I guess. And, and they've been playing that on the radio for some time now. But um, I had a train of thought here. I had a question for you. Uh, <laughs> I imagine, you know – I'm going to go back kind of a little bit on on some of the things we talked about beforehand. But so when this started for them, I imagine their life changed quite a bit. I think it did. You know, I mean, I, it wasn't like after they started it. I, I, it you know, before that, they were farmers, right? So he was a sugarcane farmer, and they, the whole family revolved around sugarcane farming, the whole thing, boiling, harvesting, selling, everything that dealt with that. And uh, no, they lived north of rain. And, you know, Joe learned how to play music at a very, very early age. Um, the entire Bro family, all of Cleoma and her brothers, including her father, all played music. You know, she played several instruments, actually, although uh, you only hear her play guitar in the recordings. Um, she also sings, of course, and he sings. But, um, you know, life afterwards did take a turn. They became, you know, more or less regional rock stars. I mean, these people were asked to play at different locations, uh, different bars between, you know, um, East Texas, all up and down uh, Highway 90. So you're looking at Lake Charles, you're looking at Crowley, you're looking at um, uh, Jennings and all of these little small dance halls and uh, house dances that would be invited to go play. And they did that throughout the late 20s all the way up into the 30s. Um, and the more that they recorded, the more people bought their records. And the more the people bought their records, the more exposure they got to get more gigs. And that was really why they recorded. It wasn't for record sales like they do today. It really was because it would gain them the exposure to be able to get more places to play. And that was more money. And so they didn't have to go back and farm again. They were able to make an entire career just off of music. Really? That's, um, but some, what are some of the other songs that maybe people would recognize today still? Sure, sure thing. Um, so uh, that's a really well-known song is Alonzo Lafayette, and it came in 1928. And uh, they, they actually uh, recorded that in New Orleans. And not long after that recording, uh, we're talking about August of that, that, that summer, they were invited to go this time to Columbia Studio in New York City. And that's probably the furthest they had ever traveled in their entire lifetime. And so they're in their, you know, they're in their tw late 20s, and... Um, they're, they're invited to go to New York City, and they go by a Greyhound bus that takes them up there, and um, they record several other tunes. Uh, Osong, One Step, is a very famous tune, very, very well-known tune during that session. Um, they recorded Fifi Poncho, <laughs> um, interesting tune itself, by the way. Uh, they recorded a, a song. They actually covered a song called My Good Old Man. Le Vue sur l'art et sa femme. And it's basically a very funny, jovial song of the, of the husband and wife um, singing back and forth, um, talking about each other in, in a very funny manner. Um, they also were the first to record uh, uh, La Marche de la Noche, which was the, the wedding march. You know? So there was a very you know, well-known uh, dance that uh, bride and grooms would have during their wedding reception. And they would march around. And there's a, I have a big story where I talk about that, actually. Um, but anyway, they were the first to actually record that. And um, since then, peop many people have recorded it. Uh, they also recorded uh, uh, songs like uh, Push, Push A Town and uh, She Has Forgotten Me and uh, When I Left Home for Texas. And a lot of these were just either country tunes that they turned into Cajun French or they, uh, these were old ballads that they were hearing in the countryside. So, uh, and they decided to record them. When we were talking earlier, you said that they, something happened around 1929. I mean, um, can you, can you tell me a little bit about that? What it was that it happened? What, which part again? Say that what again. You, me? you said, when we were talking earlier, you made mention that something had happened at, in 1929 or something about that time frame that, uh, 
there, was there some type of interruption or something? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, yeah, so they record up until about 1929, and then what happens is the the depression kicks in, and major recording labels for two years that were recording Cajun music in Louisiana stopped. Um, we don't exactly know why, but other than the fact that they just believe that in the South, r record sales plummeted. People were too poor. Uh, farmers couldn't afford Victrolas. They couldn't. They couldn't uh, afford the records themselves, and so there was no need for these major label companies to market themselves in the South anymore. And f so, between nineteen, the end of nineteen twenty nine, all the way until nineteen thirty four, there was no Cajun music recorded at all. And so, they they end up stop recording, but they're still playing house dances. They're still uh, moving around. Um, the uh, origins, though, to uh, Le Vuselard actually is my good old man. It's an old Appalachian tune. Um, really? And uh, yeah, uh, that's. Uh, I, I think it's. I think it's a funny tune, honestly. Uh, but uh, let me type this here. Now, weird. You said they'd gone all the way up to New York to, for their first recording. Uh, no, now, for the second recording session. For yeah. the second recording session. Where was the first one done again? The first one was done in New Orleans, so. Okay, and uh, after that, I mean, but there, was there another place, some place local? I mean, when did I, I know? Like they had some recording studios in the in the immediate area, and, and um, the that people use. I don't know what, when that came in came to be. So that's a so good I question. Think, yeah, you know, back in the 1920s, there were no recording studios in Louisiana other than probably in New Orleans. And even in New Orleans, you would have had just makeshift studios. Well, the, the recording studios we know of today uh, really cropped up in during the uh, late 30s and the 40s down here. Um, and so you could record at a radio station, for example, and a lot of people did that, and they would press records sometimes at radio stations. But you really didn't have recording studios creep up until about 1950, 1946. Um, That's interesting. Uh, yeah. Uh, it seems like uh, I think didn't they have one in Church Point? The a uh, uh, small one or something? Didn't they have one in Church Point? Maybe I'm remembering that wrong. They may have. They definitely had one in Ville Platte, of course. That's Swallow Studios, um, but that didn't come out until much later. Until we're talking about like 1957, uh, did that Swallow start recording his own music? So, um, but I don't know about Church Point. It's possible. Definitely not in the 20s, though. Well, uh, the myth is just. Uh, Whispered to me off of the side that, that she remembered them having one there. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go with her. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Uh, food, you know, <laughs> they may have had one. Uh, I'm not aware of it, but okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think I know where it was. Um, it, I think it was just right there off of Main Street. Um, let me see if uh, anybody is 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 okay. Uh, Unknown origins. Uh, were you answering Carol's uh, question a minute ago? The I was. The thing? origin of uh, Le Vuselor. Yeah, that's um, that's uh, my good old man. It's an old Appalachian tune, and uh, it was sung in English. And both uh, Joe and Cleoma decided to cover it uh, in Cajun French. And it was recorded during August of twenty-eight. It was during their second recording session. Now that one, the second one was in New York City. So, yeah. So. How long did their 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 music careers uh, run for? I mean, when you know they started they started in the twenties. I mean, how long did it go before they they stopped producing music? They recorded uh, music until about nineteen thirty seven, and uh, I would say they probably had forty something recordings total. Um, I think it's like forty six, if I'm not mistaken. I have to check my notes. Um, uh, did they write songs? Uh, y you know, not many. <laughs> Um, the, when uh, Joe had an interview in the 1960s, not long, not not long before his death, um, and that question came up, and the only one he could recall that he actually physically wrote from scratch was um, "When I Left Home to Go to Texas," because he wrote it about a family member, I believe, um, and uh, and how he missed the people when he was in Texas, and so he wanted to come back home. Um, all the other tunes, he believes. Um, that were cut were older tunes that he had heard 
um, like melodies that people would play in the prairies. They would take their accordions, they would take their fiddles, they would play these tunes, but a lot of people didn't have names for them. Uh, Jolie Blanc is a very famous one that uh, Cleoma's brother was the first to record. He records it as Ma Blanc à in 1929. Um, and Cleoma wrote the lyrics for it, but it was a melody that was much older. Dennis McGee had said, look, my grandfather learned that from his family, and that was before 1900. So these melodies were floating around the prairies. They really were. Uh, hold on, let me fix my mic. They were floating around the prairies, and people hadn't gotten the chance to record them. So by the time they record them, they write names to them, and those names more or less stick. Sometimes they don't stick, and sometimes people change the names. But you can look at the recording era in 1928 and see the same song recorded multiple times with totally different names, totally different lyrics, you know. Um, so they, they did write music in a way. They had to put lyrics to songs that didn't have them. But I won't know if I'm going to say that uh, – I'm not going to say that they uh, – fully wrote out every single song, both with instrumentation and lyrics. Um, so, yeah. I've got you. Looks like hey, you Carol's having a little issue there. Oh, okay. Oh. Um, see. Uh, oh, the internet is acting the fool. I understand. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, okay, well, when I asked you about what, what was their, their kind of their, their tenure in the music world, and you said uh, – roughly until about 1937. Was there anything special that happened that time frame? Or they just kind of sort of just quit doing it, life got in the way? I mean, was there anything that went on with that? Sure thing. Uh, you know, so the Depression lasted about till 1934. And uh, the two major, well, several major companies, Vicolian, Columbia, Oki Records, they were all out of the business. And in 1934, two other companies come around. Of RCA Victor creates a new label called Bluebird. Um, and they invite Joe and Cleoma to record with them in 1934. And this is slightly after the Depression has kind of worn out, and they want to test the market again. They actually, these is a budget label, so they're actually, the records are like a third of the price. It was the only way they were going to be able to sell music and record music down here. The other thing was uh, another label out of Britain comes in na named DECA, DECA uh, Records. And they also come and invite Joe and Cleoma to record Cajun music as well. Um, so they do that in 1934. During that time frame, I think the recording studio for DECA was, is in New York City as well, and I think the one for Bluebird was in San Antonio. When they're in San Antonio, they record uh, a really, really famous tune uh, called uh, uh, Montraca, uh, Montreno, and uh, more or less it's uh, uh, They Stole My Sled. And it would it'd be more popularly known as Hippie Tayo. So if you ever hear the Hippie Tayo song, Joe and Cleoma are the first to record that. It's under a different title, but, um, uh, you know, it's, it's fairly well known. Uh, they also do a DECA session in New York City that same year. Uh, and what interesting story about that is that she goes up to record in New York City, and they take another bus they get to um, New Jersey where they're going to cross over the Hoboken uh, River. Um, and when they get there, they get onto a ferry and the ferry starts to sink. And as the ferry is sinking, really? yeah, you know, they're almost to New York City. The ferry starts to sink and the lights go out. It's dark and it's icy. It's like January of 1934 or, or 35. And as the boat is sinking, um, sorry, December of 34, she's thinking about her daughter. And they get rescued from the ferry. They make it to the Decca recording studio. And while she's there, her emotions about her daughter, she takes them and writes them into a song. And it's called the Crowley Waltz. And so if you ever hear the Crowley Waltz, it's about Cleoma missing her daughter because she's afraid she's about to die <laughs> in this trip to go. Make oh, that's wild. Yeah. Pretty good. So, yeah. Now, I should, have, I should have done this at the beginning of this, and, and y'all, I, I keep using the excuse that we, we're just getting started and we're learning these things. I should have introduced Wade, uh, Wade a little bit better. I mentioned that Wade is an admin for the group, our, our, our group right here on the virtual top, and he also does a blog, and, and that's really more or less how we got, got to know him. He, uh, early Cajun Music. Uh, Correct. Dot blogspot.com, I believe. But it's that's the the blog is early Cajun music and and we we post uh, some of our word of the day or our phrase of the day things that we do. Uh, Wade and I collaborate on this and he'll 
he'll kind of tell me, hey, here's a song, here's a song that I have. This is the, the lyrics. And, and we kind of look in there. He'll spot something and say, hey, this, this is pretty interesting words or phrases here. We'll go through it and we'll, we'll make something from it. And, and I'll post it with the word of the day or something. Um, but it's, he's always got a wealth of information. Uh, it, it, it amazes me how much he knows. And we had lunch one day for the first time. We, we actually met in person finally. And, uh, and he's just whipping this information. When I tell you off the top of his head, you know, that this is, he's definitely got a passion for it and uh, a wealth of knowledge. And, uh, yeah, he would be friends at Darren Rain, right? Tony is is, uh, you know, kind of a, an amateur historian, I guess, at least uh, on all things related to Rain, and uh, his knowledge is is deep and impressive as well. Yes, it is. Uh, uh, and and look, I'm I'm also just an amateur at this as well. I really just collect a lot of the music, a lot of the history, and try to apply it to the songs where it makes sense. And write a little bit about the artist or write a little bit about the label. My main research goal is Joe and Cleoma and the Bro family. But um, on the side, it extends a lot, lot further into pretty much all what I consider early Cajun music. And that's roughly between the years of 1928, from the very beginning, all the way to about 1964. Um, you know, I, I probably go about to 1960, but I stretch it into 1964. And the reason why I call that the early Cajun period is because this is when many of the songs were still becoming standard. Um, they were uh, they were becoming standardized, and people were knowing those songs for those names and those lyrics. What happens after 1960 is the music kind of dies out. Um, rock and roll is taken over. R and B is a big deal. Country music is a big deal, and Cajun music is considered old school. And it wouldn't be until the Balfas bring the national spotlight of Cajun music at the Newport Folk Festival that everything kind of turns around again and people suddenly start getting this new renaissance of interest in Cajun music. And after 1964, it, there's a new surge of different artists and different people, but they're still pretty much recording and playing a lot of the same tunes. Uh, so I don't really cover anything past that point, um, but... Everything else is, uh, everything before that is just really fascinating. I'm very interested in how people got started in their careers. I'm interested in, how, you know, lyrics and the different songs and how they applied, how they changed over the years. That's real important to me, to see how lyrics changed and see maybe why they changed and how the language changed, you know, from 1928 to maybe now 1948 and, and maybe, you know, 1958. And so I, I like to see that stuff. And you can only do that when you look through recorded music um was cleoma miss joe falcon well yes she was she was married to joe um so uh she you know they were they were uh she was cleoma bro and he was joe falcon but they would get you know in 1928 they would get married i believe in 1931 or 32 i have to look at my notes so by 1934 she's listed on the recordings now as cleoma falcon so uh by that time they're married and uh, sorry, yeah, sorry we lost you, Carol. Uh, I'm not sure if ever, anybody else can hear us out there. Um, haven't gotten much yeah, response. You, <laughs> Feel free to broke up just for a minute. No, we, no I'm, I'm looking. We got uh, we got people looking. Um, and it, it did make me lose my train of thought. There was something that I was going to ask you about. Oh, I remember now. Did did they play? Uh, you know, in this time I hear a lot about Playoma and Joe. Did did they uh, did they play in like? But with other people, maybe maybe small bands or something like this, or they were always it was always just them two. Uh, it was generally them two leading the band. Uh, they had plenty of other um, musicians that played with them uh, from time to time. The group eventually got very very large um, uh, at at some point. So they had um, probably you know five six maybe band members towards the late thirties. Uh, different people would fill in either on guitar. Um, generally, or on fiddle. Generally, uh, she played. He played with a lot of her brothers during that time frame. So uh, Amade and Cleofa, and uh, we we can hear y'all now. Okay, I hope we've been. I hope they can hear us the whole time. I hope not just now. <laughs> uh, but if you have any questions, feel free to. Uh, send them in, and we'll talk about them tonight about Joe and Cleoma. Uh, carrying on with Brad's question, um, so at first it was just them two, and then over time uh, her family members jumped in and played alongside with them. 
Uh, and then over the years, they made, you know, musician friends. They, they would all play in the same places. And so a lot of dance halls would feature several famous bands at once. And Joe and Cleoma would be one of them. Maybe uh, Amadi Ardouin would be one. Leo Swallow would be a band. Uh, maybe Happy Fats would be a band. And, and they would all play maybe at benefit concerts, dance halls, and things like that, house dances and such. So, par les maisons. Are you there? Oh, no. Oh, not again. Hey, hello. Hello. I lost him. Hello. Hello. It's a lot. Okay, I think we're back now. <laughs> okay. I apologize. I wasn't sure if it was me or if it was Brad. It looks like it was Brad this time. So. <laughs> oh man, I thought it was you. Uh, I was talking to myself, I guess. Oh, uh, uh, okay, so uh, let's carry on. Do we have any other questions? And uh, okay, I guess it looks it, like we got it you was back. You that so. time. <laughs> it was you. I it was you, man. I was filling in dead air, boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was, I was absent. Um, I was telling myself <laughs> how you've been doing this for a little while. That you, it, you know, something that you're passionate about, and that you you work with a lot of other people, some other musicians and other uh, French speakers who will listen to the things that you take the albums, you dub it to digital. And you all sit there and work on it and, and going through a lot of people offering their, their opinions as to what it is that they're saying in these songs. Because, you know, just like with modern music, a lot of times people argue about what the lyrics are. And uh, I, get, I get it that it's the same process here. You're listening to something that was said a long time ago. And you have a lot of people that come together and you'll come to a consensus on what was being sung there. Uh, I think it's pretty excellent. I think it's it's great that you're doing that. I think it's great that you have people to help you with it. Uh, I've had the pleasure, along with some of the other admins, to help a, a couple of times for whatever that was worth. You know, mm -hmm. talking about me, a guy that started three years ago. Um, but I appreciate what you do there, Wade. And and it to me, ça fait moi, right? It's a it's a good thing. It's an important part of our our culture and our history. And uh, I know there's several young people that that are part of the way that they're learning the language is through the music, through the old music, and and listening to the lyrics and 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 hearing it and repeating it. I agree. So I'm gonna back up a little bit back to 1928 when their music career gets started. They uh, they get found out and. Uh, that George Burr decides to drive him to New Orleans and to go make the first recording. And while he's there, um, they bring a friend with them, Leon Mesh. And Leon goes with them, and uh, they arrive. And um, he had already made an arrangement to uh, buy 250 of the records. And so they bought 250 of the records. He gets there, and the, the, record, the recording engineers look at the, 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 the people and say, well, where's the orchestra? Where's, where's the musicians? And they pointed to Joe and Cleoma, and they said, well, that's not enough, mu that's not enough people to make any music. And uh, so George, you know, went over and they talked to him for a little while. And he said, look, uh, I'll buy, I'll double the order. I'll buy 500 records. And they said, well, what are you going to do with 500 records? You know, and he's like, look, I'll, I'll take care of it. Uh, and they said, okay, well, let's hear a song first. And so they played a song. And those rec recording engineers looked at each other and like, wow, that's more music than we've ever heard out of two instruments in our lives. And so they recorded a tune, they played it back, and they said, look, we're going we're gonna to make a lot of music. We're going to sell a lot of records. Get ready. You know? And he talks about that in the 1960s in an interview where he discusses what it was like to make the very first Cajun recording. So uh, uh, there's, a lot, there's a very famous photo that was taken slightly uh, after that. Uh, I'm going to look for it in a second. And um, it's a fairly well-known photo. 
Uh, let me see if I can pull it up. I think I kind of threw it out there as part of the advertisement. Um, of course, my computer is going to be like this, but uh, you've probably seen this photo before. And uh, nope, that's not what I wanted to do. Bear with me. Um, no problem. But and so you might see this photo before. Anybody can see it. I hope so. I see it. Okay. And uh, we we know where this is taken now. This was actually he's holding a Monarch accordion. She's holding a National guitar. The company National Brand Guitars, for a long time on their website, featured Cleoma as a historical artist of theirs because <laughs> she was holding that guitar. Um, that's actually taken at the Barnett Photo Studio in Crowley. Um, he, re he took photos from the late 1800s all the way into 1960, and uh, this is actually in those archives, and we can tell from the background and a lot of the props that were used in that photo. Um, so... Let me see if I can go back and, and close that off and see if you can see me now. I see you now. Okay, great. Um, so back to this. Let me see here. And uh, I'm going to get to the question in a second. Um, so that, that's a very famous photo because it's been used on a lot of album covers. It's been used on a lot of CDs and to, you know, talk about Cajun music. That photo is this, is this photograph here. And uh, this is the original. Um, we believe it was taken either slightly before or slightly after uh, 1928, after their first recording session. She's very young. He is too. Um, and um, it's their very first photo of them two together. Um, they were, uh, Joe was from Rain. Actually, he grew up not far from Roberts Cove. He was living in around the uh, Falcon Homestead, which is on the Church Point Highway. It's the, it's the road from north of Rain that leads out to uh, Church Point, and that's kind of where they grew up. Cleoma was a bro. She was from Crowley. They grew up in Crowley, and after they got married, he moved with her to Crowley because uh, she was the city girl, and he, she he surely wasn't going to live in the she wasn't going to live in the country north of Rain. That's for sure. And uh, what she said goes. <laughs> so if she, she couldn't possibly live a lifestyle in the country. She was too much of a city girl. And uh, she loved to travel too, man. They traveled to Texas a lot. And it shows in her song. She sings about Texas all the time. All the time. So Yeah, I don't know if it was the same way for everybody else. When you, you just before you started saying something about Texas, it it uh flipped out. I was going yeah. to say that they, uh, she loved to travel. She loved to go to Texas. And uh, I know in some of the music that they, they talk about Texas often. So, yeah. you know, It's funny that you mentioned that. And it's just a little aside. Uh, but I've told the story a few times to different people as we talk about it. I mean, it, my hometown is Church Point. That's, that's my family. That's my people there. And when I was 10 years old, uh, we moved from Church Point to Crowley. And for us, that was like we went to the big city. <laughs> you know? That's it, was, it was a big change for us. It was a big change. And it, you know, sadly, Crowley's a great place. Uh, sadly for me, it, it meant that I was away from my family, all the people that spoke French around me at a regular basis. And it may not seem like a big deal going from Church Point to Crowley, but all of a sudden these people that would just drop in or you all, you know, we'd go right around the afternoon, go and visit everybody. Uh, you you left that exposure, you know. It was just that's another thing, another story, another day. I hear but, you. Um, getting so, back on topic here. Oh yeah. So um, I want to share with another photo. This is um, you should be able to see this recording. This is my copy of Alonzo Lafayette. Uh, I believe you should see it by now. I do. And uh, what you see, what you notice was, is what's unique is that Columbia were out in New York and they came down here and they completely um, butchered the name Alonzo yeah, Alafayette. That. <laughs> um, they list it as a vocal Arcadian French song, uh, whatever Arcadian is. And uh, they would not be the only label to use the word Arcadian. I don't understand why they use that word to describe Acadian songs, but it was not the word Cajun really wasn't. Uh, in the, in the lexicon, I guess, for them at the time. Uh, you'll also notice his middle name has an F. Funny enough, his daughter said he never had a middle name. Uh, he, always yeah. wanted, he always wanted one, and so he just came up with the letter F. 
<laughs> so, hey. you know, it, Hey, that's how it worked back then, I suppose. And, uh, uh, whatever works, man. Yeah. 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 I'm trying to think of some other, uh, things that you guys would be interested in that's seeing. Interesting. And I, uh, and I, I hope to have a little bit more conversation about it in the group after we're, we're finished here. Okay. I, when we first started the group, and I don't believe the lady's there anymore, but there was a lady that had come and she kept posting a lot of stuff about Arcadia and Arcadians and stuff like this. And, and it meant nothing to me at the time. Mm-hmm. Still doesn't mean a lot to me. I, I, at the time I did a lot of, a little bit of homework on it, just trying and, and I didn't get the connection, but I think there's a few people out there that, that, that do understand what the connection is with it. And, and some of it could just be stuff like this where people were just spelling it the way they thought it was right right here's um in uh we fast forward to about 1932 this is actually their wedding photo it was also taken either in crowley or rain at a you know photo booth you may recognize the background but uh that's actually her wedding dress Uh, they were very poor obviously and um they didn't have a lot of money and she would um she would change up her her fancy, her one fancy dress by putting a shawl on it or maybe decorating it a little bit different than the last time she wore it. But this was it. This was their nice outfits right here. You know, I like the glove. I like seeing her hat and she looks very Clara, you know, um, what's the, um, the girl from the twenties. Very, um, I don't explain it. Uh, uh, if, you, if you hadn't said it, I could have told you. <laughs> oh, I'm not, I'm not getting the names right, but uh, very famous 1920s uh, look. You know, she really looked uh, the part here, and you can tell in her outfits that she was that way, and uh, she was trying to stay, up, uh, I don't know, abreast with of all the, the latest fashions. <laughs> but it was that, tough for that, them to do, you know. Uh, they they didn't have glove, a lot of money. So. Arm glove? Is that glove go all the way up? I have no idea. That's a great question. I, I have no clue. Uh, interesting photo, though. Uh, yeah, just looking at it from here. I mean, of course, I ain't got my glasses on, so for whatever that's yeah. worth. Um, so they did record until about 1937. They had several sessions between 34 and 37 um, with both Bluebird and Decca. They probably recorded the most with Decca. And by 1935, string band was a hot thing, you know, especially with the influence from Texas coming in. Uh, String bands uh, like Leo Swallow, J.B. Fusley, Happy Fats, those guys were coming in. And look, they had to change their sound. So they recorded a lot of string band music in 1936 and in 1937. They also recorded some jazz tunes uh, during those last sessions where they covered just real popular tunes that were on the radio at the time. Um, they would uh, they were recording um, a lot of Jimmy Rogers stuff. She loved Jimmy Rogers. Uh, bluesy things, you know. Um, she recorded uh, a Hawaiian song that was uh, kind of unique. She recorded uh, 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 Fats Waller jazz tune, um, Lulu's Back in Town, you know, uh, several, several different covers of radio things because I think they were just running out of traditional stuff. You know, by that time, you have done all the traditional ballads that were in the Acadian prairies. You weren't really writing a lot of stuff. And so at this time, they were running out of material and they were covering country tunes and all these radio tunes. And then, um, Something happened between 1937 and 1939. They were they were they were playing more dance halls. They were playing more house dances. They were traveling a lot, lot more and a lot further. Uh, they were going to Texas very often by this time. But in 1941, uh, a, a tragic thing happened. Um, the story is not quite clear, but we've been able to piece together uh, what we think happened. Okay, she was coming back from a trip. And she got off of a bus and either she uh, was getting dropped off on a car or she was, she was in the street and she was getting out of the bus and passing between a bus and a car. But all we know is that the door handle of a car caught her sweater and the driver took off and he ended up dragging her for probably about a quarter of a mile. Oh my God. She she was in the hospital. Some people said she was in the hospital for a year and a half, but we know now because we have the, the medical records, she was actually at Crowley in the hospital for four months, and then she passed away from internal injuries. Um, she just she never really recovered from all of that, and they buried her in Crowley. So she passed in 1941. Um, he would 
change his music altogether. As a matter of fact, he uh, he stopped drinking. They were he was a huge alcoholic. I mean, many of those musicians drank, 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 drank. And after her death, he sobered up quite a bit. Um, he formed a new band. Yeah, they played. They kept the music playing, but he got jobs in the oil field during the forties, um, and kept just playing in dance halls. You know, all the way up into the fifties. He would meet another woman named Teresa Mo in 1950 and they would get married um and he lived with teresa probably until you know his death in 1965 he he passed away in 1965 he did his he did two interviews that year and then he passed away so you yeah. know that that's very very interesting stuff there and i'm impressed with the, your knowledge i mean you just firing that off uh like that it's that's pretty <laughs> impressive uh I have trouble remembering, you know, details about myself, let alone. <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> so I do work with a lot of the families that are connected to the bros. I work a lot with the families connected to the Falcons, of course. And, of course, that's my family as well. A lot of family history. Of course, genealogy plays a big part. Um, Falcon itself is actually a Spanish name. It, uh, it is Isleño name, which means it's just a Canary Island Spanish name. And uh, a lot of names like Domingue and Rodrigue, you know, you'd be surprised they actually, you know, stem from uh, S Spanish origins. And uh, people don't know that. Segura, Vietar, you know, Romero, the names like that. But uh, his other side was Acadian. You know, his, his daddy was uh, Pierre Falcone, but his mama was Maria Vilio Boudreau. And she was Acadian, full Acadian. So he was half Spanish, half French. Uh, very much uh, Creole at the time, right? So, you know, you look at um, um, the bro side, and it seems to be all Acadian. Uh, as a matter of fact, her grandfather, I believe, was the son of uh, one of the bros that uh, built Bro Bridge, the actual Pont de Bro, you know. Um, so, uh, Pont Bro, right? So, uh, you know, she, she stems from that lineage of people. And uh, in my presentations I give, which I've given of several over the past couple of years, I talk about their ancestry. I talk about their genealogy, where they came up, where they grew up, and things like that. Uh, and so their family moved from Bro Bridge to, to Crowley at some point, and that's where she was born and raised. And um, his family had moved from the Spanish uh, settlements near Donaldsonville to Rain. And they grew up there. Um, so I think that answers Carol's question there. I think so. I'm, well, I'm going to show the, the link to your site. Um, just give me one second here. Um, yeah, sure thing. And... I'll be able to see and uh, all right it's on its way all right y'all this is this is the the, the link to, to Wade's uh, blog excuse me for for the early cage of music and he he has so many songs that he's done on there that it's, it's just it's unreal uh, you get the time. Take a look at it. We'll put the link uh, on the thread uh, with the video here in our group, and I'll include it with the YouTube video. Uh, so for the folks that are just directly to it, and all right, by all means, go and check out some of the other stuff that he's done. And, and Wade and I have talked about this. Uh, we're looking at if there's an interest in uh, doing these types of things going forward. Uh, discussing some of the other key figures in, in the, the Cajun music and the culture. Uh, we've talked about possibly getting some other, uh, some of the musicians that we're, we're aware of or familiar with uh, who have knowledge of some of the history and get them on here if we can and, and get them talking to you a little bit. Um, wait, I don't know if you know, but you're, 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 I'm not sure what you're sharing, but it's your computer screen and I, I can see you flipping things around. Okay, um, I, I was trying to share a photo. I don't know if that worked. There but, it is. Okay, I got it now. Well, you had it. It was. Now you now I see me. <laughs> well, maybe that didn't work out so well. Um, yeah. I tried to share a photo, and it might not have worked so well. Hold on. 
you, you had it for a second. You had it for a second. I think what you're doing is just sharing the whole screen. And uh, there's, we'll play with it later. There's a way to actually share just the, just the photo. Yeah, that's what I'm trying uh, to do. Let me know if it comes up. It, but speak. Say something. Hello, I'm here. Yeah, I, I'm seeing two screens is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing two tabs. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. But that's all right. We'll, we, we, we can work on this and, and uh, go forward with it. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, is there anything else that you want to throw out there before we, uh, we conclude for the evening? Um, let me see here. Let me try this one more time. I'm going to try a different photo and see if this helps. Um, let me know if you get this. That should have worked, huh? Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, last thing, this is a photo of the family. Uh, they had adopted a daughter, Lulu. This is actually taken in 1934, and it's the last photo of Cleoma before um, they kick off their recording career. And uh, this was taken by Lauren Post. He was um, a professor at LSU. He was, very, uh, he was from Rain, and he was uh, very good friends with the uh, Falcon family. And uh, he grew up with them and, and, and knew them well, loved Joe's music. And uh, he takes this very famous photo, ends up getting used all over the place. That's Lulu. She passed away about two years ago. I believe it's been two. And uh, I got to talk to her several, several times before she passed. And uh, um, so that uh, you can see the, the uh, their house on the left. And they're in Crowley at that point. So uh, that's a national resonator guitar she's got right there. And he's holding a monarch. Um, and you can see that old Model A in the background, <laughs> or whatever it looks like to me. I don't, I don't know cars all that well, but uh, um, so, yep, yeah, that's that's her last photo right there. It's a great picture. Um, I, I, you know, all the things you're pointing out the little things out, and I, I was while it was up there, I was doing the same thing. I was my eyes were bouncing off each of these things, <laughs> and they're going, "Oh wow, that's great. That's old. That's you know." It's it's a piece of history, and you know I don't know how how expensive or how difficult it was for people to have their their pictures taken back then. I mean, I, I take it that it was a big deal for somebody to show up and take a picture of you. Uh, I think it was. I mean, I think you went to a, a photo studio and you actually had a family photo taken, uh, like the Barnett photo. I mean that. You know, that collection sits at UL, and there are families upon families sitting in that collection of during the 1920s and 19-teens, where they just, he had taken photos of all these people, and uh, and the, those, co those collection, that collection still sits there, and, you know, I think that's just what you did. You went to a place that took photos like that, and you, you probably didn't have a lot of people who had camera equipment that just went around taking photos just of just anybody, so we're lucky to have those there. And uh, I guess the last thing I wanted to share with everybody was that there are several projects that are coming out fairly soon regarding Joan Cleoma. Um, one of them is going to be um, PBS is uh, wrapping up their documentary uh, this year with uh, the help of the BBC on the history of Joe Cleoma and the Bro Brothers. That's cool. It, it should air in November. Um, is the latest I've been told. So uh, the show is going to be called American Epic. And I will just put a little link here so people can kind of go to it. Um, and you can uh, like their page. And, of course, I also put a link to Joe Falcon Cleoma Bro page, which I kind of manage. And uh, when the show does air on PBS and you are listening to um, – um, uh, I'm sorry, and if you're watching one of these pages, you'll get an, an alert letting you know that the show is going to come up. And uh, and I think it's going to be fascinating. I mean, we've we've really helped them with photographs and some of the story and their recording career, and that's pretty much what they're going to uh, cover, all that entire co recording career. Uh, the next project that's going to be working on is, that's getting worked on is by Chris Christopher King. Um, he's a man out of Virginia who's working on a two-CD set of all their music. Their music actually has never been compiled in one location. It spans compilations, uh, Cajun music CD compilations in Europe and the United States. And if you get the right mix of CDs, you can put together a collection of some of their music. He's going to do almost everything in a two-CD set. Hopefully, he'll release it sometime next year in 2017. And lastly, all of my research regarding the family um, is being collected right now. 
and I'm hoping to be able to put something out, maybe some type of book, booklet. I'm not exactly sure exactly what it's going to turn out to be, but I want to condense it all into a piece that people can bring it home and they can read and they can learn more about their recordings, their family and all the, it's really important that I'm putting the lyrics on, you know, social media is that way people can look at the lyrics, listen to the song. And if they've got corrections or additions, those corrections are going to be important because that's going to be part of their history. And we want to make sure we get the music right as well. And so feel free to go through um, the, the pages on the blog site that talk about them and read about their history. And if you, you, you have got corrections or additions to some of their, their lyrics, please submit that. I'm always open for that kind of stuff. Um, and lastly, um, October 5th, I will be at the Lafayette Public Library and doing essentially what we're doing here, but I will be covering their entire life in detail. Uh, it's going to be a big show. Uh, it'll be uh, downtown Lafayette and um, at the at the big library, uh, October 5th. I think it's at 6 p.m., uh, and it uh, should be good. So come check it out. It's open for everybody, to the public, free. So, yeah. You can ask some more. Everybody, <laughs> so, Wade Falcon. All right, guys. Thank you all so much. <laughs> All right, thank y'all. We'll awesome. talk after a while. Good deal, and man. I'm going to end the broadcast now. Excellent. Bonsoir. Bonsoir.